Travis. He's the traditional knowledge keeper and member of the Seneca Nation. He's Bear Clan from Grand River Territory, Six Nations. Darren's currently pursuing his PhD in community psychology at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, his research is focused on First Nation community development, indigenous research methodologies, suicide prevention, and colonial trauma. Darren specializes in working with First Nation peoples, inspiring them to be proud of their heritage and take a rightful place in modern society. Darren has over 20 years of experience working in radio, education, addiction, and community development. Thank you, Darren, for uh, um, uh, speaking to our uh, community health nursing class, and we really appreciate your time that you're taking today. So just as a recap, we just would like to know, as, a, you know, as our Aboriginal community, as they are a vulnerable population, what are some things that we as community health nurses need to know as we provide uh, nursing care? Uh, moving forward. So thank you again for your time. Yeah, uh, no worries. It's certainly my pleasure, my honor to uh, have the chance to visit with you. Um, that's a big question. <laughs> you can do an entire course just on that question. Because you have to understand Indigenous approaches to health, but I think what's missing for many people in many different areas, not just in, in health or community health, it's in law, it's all over the place, um, political science, and a lot of the classes I've visited here on campus. We don't, in this country, we don't get any history about Indigenous peoples. Um, we enter into different helping fields, uh, in particular, in, in, in health, what we're talking about today. Um, and you begin to look at the population health data. And you see the addiction rates and the family violence, the cancer, diabetes, and just about every single one, Indigenous people are on the top of that list. But you have to ask yourself, how, in one of the most developed countries in the world, can an entire race of people end up in the margins with the poorest health conditions than any other population of people? Yes, yes. And that's the missing piece when we start talking about community health and well-being that we never get to. Now, again, in my discipline of community psychology, and I'm sure many of your students aren't aware of it, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but what we look at, um, is we do a critical analysis of what needs to exist in community to maximize health and well-being for all its citizens. It really emerged out of uh, clinical psychology in the 1960s and when they started mass deinstitutionalizing of mental health consumers. Uh, poverty rates are going up, homelessness and, and mental health apprehension start just going off the charts. So clinicians then shifted gears and, and start asking these critical questions of community and start looking at law, social policy, legislation, community organizations, interventions, you know, structurally, but also within families, within individuals. And initially it was with mental health consumers then they started realizing that many populations of people experience marginalization and oppression. So then they start doing analysis to these different things through a gender lens, through differing abilities, through uh, race and class, sexual orientation. So it's a great place to play if you're a social justice warrior, mm -hmm. because this is the stuff that we deeply embed ourselves in all the isms of social justice and you can't have any of these critical discussions without examining indigenous people because of the social political history of the settlement of Canada and its impact on indigenous people. You see for years what we've done is we've looked at these population health stats and we've said that's the problem. That's not the problem, they're the symptoms. What the problem really is, the root cause of why health is so skewed for Indigenous people is all those colonial uh, social political laws and legislation to create this crisis in healthcare. 
um, whether it's prevention, health promotion, or actual physical needs in terms of the cancer, diabetes, I mean, it's all wrapped into such a sophisticated nightmare to unravel um, for Indigenous peoples. So I certainly can't pretend in, in a few minutes to share this with you. No. You said this is, this is an entire course. Um, and, and in fact, you could really make an entire degree out of it. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And so, but I guess the, the place that, that I think would assist you most in, in this conversation is to realize because again, just imagine that. Now, hopefully, most of your students are aware of Indian residential school. Yes. Um, <coughs> but there was also a time period that got nicknamed the 60s scoop, and mm -hmm. not many people are aware of this. So what happened was when they start lessening demands for Indigenous children to have to go to Indian residential school, they started sending child welfare workers into reserve, and they start apprehending children for neglect and not placing them into foster care but placing them into adoption. So you had forced adoptions where indigenous <coughs> families were not even allowed to get their children back. So you've got generations of people who had uh, uh, residential school experience, then the 60s scoop. So now in our urban centers, whether or not uh, as a career, your, your students end up in an urban center or in one of the remote communities in the north or rural area, where you're going to encounter a lot more indigenous people, you have to understand. It's okay. Sorry. It's okay. Um, you have to understand this history and this legacy and what Indian Residential School and the 60s Scoop really did in terms of its impacting on indigeneity. So, now again, those are just two. We have to really examine the entire. Canadian Indian social policy of the Indian Act and what its intention was. So the intention and the belief by the Canadian government was to construct a future of no more Indigenous people. Wow. So everything that the Indian Act represents is a strategy and a process to make sure the elimination of Indigenous people. So they made our ceremonies illegal. They made it illegal to gather in public. The reservation system was created and they, they created the reserves and often, although the reserves are in the far remote north today, that's not where the indigenous people lived. Mm -hmm. We lived across this country, across mm -hmm. this entire continent. But because of settlement, Settlement is all along the American border. Mm -hmm. So most of the reserves got kicked up north, mm -hmm. out of sight, out of mind. I always wondered that. And the reserves were set up, in, not in all places, but in most places as gated communities. So, you know, um, as indigenous people, well, the legal term still is Indian, mm -hmm. right, in, in Canadian law. So you, um, as a registered Indian in 1874, when they created the Indian Act, a registered Indian meant you were an uncivilized ward of state. And as an uncivilized ward of state, the state has all fiduciary uh, duty and responsibility to care for the Indians. So many Canadians today wonder why the federal government is involved in education and health care, mm -hmm. economic development, mm -hmm. uh, um, water and wastewater management. Mm -hmm. All, every conceivable sense of existence is controlled on reserve by the Indian Act. So we've had 150 years of this uh, colonial uh, relationship and everyone knows indigenous and, and, and allied peoples and the federal government know we need to imagine life outside of the Indian Act but how do we get there that's the critical question because for many Canadians they see the money and the resources that are trying to be spent to 
um, help support indigenous people and improve their health conditions. And I, I certainly don't deny the fact that the federal government has spent millions, if not billions of dollars, trying to fix this situation. And they haven't done it successfully because they've been doing it all the wrong way. Uh, somebody in Ottawa or somebody in Toronto comes up with a great plan or a great initiative and said, this is gonna fix things. Send it out to all 634 reserves in the country. So the first thing wrong with that is you have to understand that there are hundreds of different nations of indigenous people with very distinct and culturally diverse ways of knowing and understanding and ceremonies. As diverse as any other continent in the world, right? Mm -hmm. But people don't realize that. They think, oh, there's more, there's, there's Indian or indigenous, mm -hmm. there's just one. Well, not only do we have uh, First Nations, we've got Inuit and we've got Métis peoples. Mm -hmm. Uh, who, again, have such a critical history, each of their own, and how they experience settlement, right? So we've got a lot to learn before we can get to any critical level of understanding of why the population health data is what it is. Mm -hmm. So when we go back to analyzing social policy in Canadian law, the intent was civilization and assimilation because they made the grand assumption that we were uncivilized, right? They made it so in law that we were uncivilized and that they were looking to control our entire development and future development. It was basically assimilate into Canadian society or not exist. So their initial attempts were destroying us through governance because they made our traditional forms of government illegal. So we couldn't govern our, our own lives. And then when that wasn't working, then they uh, did the, the spiritual destruction by introducing us into uh, Indian residential schools where we're only in the last 20 years fully comprehending the magnitude of the violence experienced by Indian residential school survivors in the sexual abuse and the terror and torture that occurred at some of these schools. And I've been telling this week to, to several schools I visit, there's actually a court case that's still behalf of the, uh, of the Canadian court system from survivors of St. Anne's School. You heard of that. St. Anne's School had an electric chair and they would strap kids in there and torture them. Mm. And these were people of faith, right? That did these kind of things. So when, even if you just consider the magnitude of what it must have been like to go mm -hmm. to school in these environments without love, without caring, without compassion, without any kind of nurturing whatsoever, you physically survive and you go on to make babies. Mm -hmm. What kind of parent are you going to be when you've never experienced love, caring, and compassion, and nurturing? It's making sense. Mm -hmm. How can you provide mm -hmm. these basic human things to children when mm -hmm. you've never received them? Because mm -hmm. you don't magically know how to parent. Exactly. There's no magic wand that, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you made a baby, yeah, you yeah. know what you're doing now. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. It's, it's conditioned exactly. through your own social construction, exactly. through your own uh, life as a child and watching, you know, how your mom did things, mm -hmm. how your dad did things, how your aunties and grandparents did mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're plucked out of that, what are you left to do? Yeah. So the sad reality resulting now of generations and generations of people going through Indian residential school or forced adoptions is they've lost a significant disconnect to their indigeneity. They don't know their culture, they don't know their language, they don't know their ceremonies, which is at the very core of their identity. And when you have an individual with a fractured identity that doesn't know where they fit in this world, in this universe, they're always going to be seeking questioning and pondering where you find safety. Mm 
And the unfortunate thing, what's filled that void are communities of trauma, of addiction, of violence, of crime, of sexual violence, right? I mean, imagine, you know, we know what the suicide rates are, are like, and, and what's so tragic is the suicides are so young, 11 and 12 years of age. What must happen in that baby's life for them to fully believe there's nothing worth living? You imagine the trauma they must have witnessed and experienced to take their life. Unbelievable, it right? Is. But this is our country. Yes. Right? And this is what we don't know. And suddenly we're going through a professional training in community health and well being. And we're being put into the places where we're going to be encountering Indigenous people. And the unfortunate thing, because this history isn't taught anywhere. In this country, there's a significant amount of racism towards Indigenous people. Yes, there is. We see these population health data, and there's tons of misinformation that exists out there, and uh, we get a free monthly check and free house and all this thing, and we don't pay taxes, which is all baloney. <laughs> you know, you have to understand some of the stuff, right? It mm. is, you know. Uh, again, the reason why these things are provided is because it's in the Indian Act, right? Uh, but all the money I earn is taxed like every single other Canadian, unless I work on the reserve, right? And guess what? In many communities across the country, there's no economy on the reserve, so okay. they have to work off the reserve. Exactly. So a large population of Indigenous people in this country make a contribution to the state like every other citizen does. So we got to throw that garbage away that we don't pay tax. What happens is uh, when I make a retail purchase, I have to identify as an Indian and I get the PST portion of mm -hmm. the HST reduced in Ontario, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm um, 8% tax exempt mm -hmm. <laughs> on a retail purchase, right? Mm -hmm. And that's it, right? And it's because we're considered to be federal citizens, which is why we don't pay provincial tax, tax, right? So when you start looking at this misinformation that mm -hmm. exists out there and different benefits and privilege extended to Indigenous peoples, in Canada, well, what ends up happening is because Canadians lack the basic history and they see the benefits as privileges to Indigenous populations, um, and then we see acts of civil disobedience and protest, Canadians develop a deep resentment towards Indigenous people, which really results in this racism and discrimination. And when these events and circumstances come up, like protest, what I hear from many Canadians is, why don't they just get over it? What more could they possibly want? Mm -hmm. They get everything for free, you know, and so we have to deconstruct all that stuff because when we're looking at the population health data, and we're seeing the health crisis that exists with Indigenous peoples. We're blaming them for their condition. And we're saying, why don't they just get a job? Why don't they go to school? Why don't they do something for themselves? And, and so we have to deconstruct that. And the only way that you can do that is through education, through awareness because then you'll get to a level of understanding and then hopefully you get to a level of empathy. Because mm -hmm. right now there's no empathy for Indigenous people. No. When we're looking at them and their current health crisis, we're, we're blaming victims here. And they're victims of a long-standing, deliberate, intended social policy and law which was designed to dehumanize them disenfranchise them from their land, disenfranchise them from their culture, from their language, from their governance, 
and we put them onto the reserve and left them there to die. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem that's occurred with this thinking is little did they know how stubborn we really were. <laughs> <laughs> and in that stubbornness, has built all this resistance that in spite of these health conditions, our peoples are surviving. Even though they were tortured through Indian residential school and things like that, we survived. We're not surviving well, we're not surviving healthily, but we're here. And this is where we need to begin to advance Indigenous health and well-being. And this is where your students can begin to be, start shaping out what role they can play as a health practitioner in helping to support Indigenous health and well-being. So the next phase of this learning is even understanding what is Indigenous health and well-being. Well, we talk so far beyond our physical health and our mental health. But we have to talk about the spiritual health, right? And the emotional health. Because our concept of well-being goes far beyond the Western medicine and approaches. And we certainly don't use a deficit model that there must be something deficient in our bodies to have these things happen. So again, and, and as we were talking before, you mentioned um, before we began, you mentioned the cancer rates and diabetes and things, and there's, there's systemic problems to why these health crises exist. So when you talk about cancer, indigenous people across the country, uh, six times higher the cancer rate than the rest of Canadians. Well, why? Well, because of business practices for years and doing resource development, mining, whether it's forestry or, mm. or precious minerals, they go into the far northern parts of the country and they construct a mine, they construct all the heavy equipment. Do they ship out their toxic waste? Absolutely not. They do not ship out their toxic waste. They bury it into the ground, they dump it into the water, it leaches into the water supply. So right now I'm doing research in northern Ontario. I'm working within one community that's been in a boil water advisory for 24 years. 24 years. They're a small, remote, flying community. Only a few hundred people living in reserve. But the federal government says it's not cost efficient for us to put a water treatment plant there. Wow. That's much cheaper for us to send you water. And the water supply that you have, just boil it. Right? Wow. It's more cost efficient. Wow. Right? It doesn't make any sense. So often when I talk about this stuff, we have to talk about two different Canadas. There's a Canada experienced by most of its citizens is living a life of a long heritage of human rights protections, of believing in social welfare, believing in equality and fairness, and we've created a just society. But then there's a different Canada that Indigenous people have experienced. It's one that says Canada's been one of the largest human rights violators in the world. Mm -hmm. The fact that food security, housing, basic human rights are denied on a daily basis to Indigenous people in this country. And we're not doing anything about it. But the real disgusting part of this is Indigenous people's rights are actually enshrined in Canadian law. In Canadian Constitution, the Canadian government in 1982 in the new Constitution, Section 35, has affirmed there is such a thing as Aboriginal people's rights, mm 
and Aboriginal treaty rights, which saying that every single citizen in this country is supposed to be abiding by treaty to honor both the ancient agreements and the modern day agreements. So there's a saying that's thrown around that we are all treaty people in this country. How many of your students know that? I don't think any of them know because I didn't know that either. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Now the problem is, is the state actively turns a blind eye to development that's denying these human rights protections and these indigenous rights protections. So when our rights are infringed upon, or even when they may be infringed upon, proponents of an industry are supposed to go through a process and the Crown is supposed to go through a process of notifying and consulting and accommodating Indigenous peoples when their mm -hmm. rights are being impacted. That's what's not happening. So when you see across the country where Indigenous communities are barricading logging roads or mining roads or whatever, this is why. Because mm -hmm. proponents are allowed to enter into their lands without consulting, without informing them about anything relation. what's going on. And again, wrapping this back around to health, we know that water and land and the toxics, the waste that they're using with a lot of these practices are going to be left there to leach into the water supplies. This is the source of that cancer. Mm -hmm. Whether it's airborne or water, it's, mm. it's there, right? Diabetes, there's a whole other conversation, right? This comes back to, again, many indigenous people eat a colonized diet. Um, but it's built from uh, the staple foods that were handed out over the generations mm. to indigenous community. Because guess what? White flour is cheap. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know, you know, I, I just seen in, in, in a news story in the CBC News, and, and we mm -hmm. often have this discussion at, uh, at Laurier University, because mm -hmm. we'll have a, uh, we've got an Aboriginal student center, and they'll have, uh, you know, Indian tacos, yeah. right? Yeah. And is Indian taco an indigenous food? Absolutely not. No, it's right? not. <laughs> no. It, it's white flour. It's white flour. Right? To, to make the bannock and to make was, the bread and things you, like that. What do you use to you make know? bannock with then before? Right? So the Haudenosaunee, we yeah. use corn. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So we had cornbread. Mm. You know, it's nothing like the white flour bread or bannock mm. or scone mm. or whatever nickname mm. you want to give mm. it. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, fry bread, you know. It's good though. It, was, it, hey, <laughs> it, it is good. It is good. It's terribly unhealthy. But it is good. You know, like most things, right? Mm. Um, but yeah, it's not an indigenous food. Get like corn is, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, again, even looking at the domestic meats that we eat, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, oh, yeah. I never ate that. I mean, we ate deer and moose and mm -hmm. caribou and elk mm -hmm. and rabbits and things like that, squirrels. Um, so looking at how, what many communities are trying to do now is they're trying to decolonize their diet. Mm -hmm. And we, we had a whole program at Six Nations and, and people who volunteered to go through this. And on average, in six months, you know, some of these people lost 35 pounds. Wow. You know, from just decolonizing their diet and eating only traditional foods. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so, it, I mean, so yeah, I mean, you expose generations of people and we know that this disease is genetic, and, mm -hmm. but this is where the source is from. So um, there's a small little video, you know, you, I don't know if you could source it down, but I think it's, it's called White Death. Mm -hmm. And that's what it looks at, how these staple food items were introduced into indigenous communities because they were sort of, you know, uh, starving. Mm -hmm. And so the government start doing these government handouts and mm -hmm. stuff, right? So th there's a, like I said, um, it's a very long, complicated mm -hmm. story here. And because these gaps in knowledge aren't presented to many Canadian students, um, 
we, we don't know how to get to that empathetic place. And so this is essential, those of you that are going to be entering into the helping field. You have to understand the context to how we got here. And, and again, we could just as easily be having a conversation with, about people with differing abilities, sexual orientation, gender, class. I mean, we have to deconstruct our white Anglo male society, right? Because this is, this is what mm -hmm. this is all about, right? I mean, this is inherently the society, although we're trying to live a very just society, um, we have these mechanisms of power and privilege that are inherently ingrained in the institutional makeup, whether it's law, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's child welfare, it's every single institution we have in this country. Um, and the only way we can deconstruct that is by intentional, critical and conscious awareness to be able to call it out when we witness it. And those of you that are, are feeling the, uh, a bone in your body for social justice and allyship, becoming aware of it, becoming aware of marginalization and oppression is only the start. We need leadership. We need people to call out racism, to call out when people are marginalized, to identify when people are oppressed. And those that retain power and privilege in this country must use that power and privilege in a manner to share power and to share privilege. And I think that's the hardest thing when we're talking about a westernized society is because that privilege is ingrained that we're trying to become educated, we're trying to achieve levels of power and of success and of money. And then once we're there, those that retain power in this country are so terrified to share that power because they don't see it as sharing power. They see it as losing power. And we have to get to that point of realizing what is it that we want to see as a country? And I know we have a beautiful Canadian ideology that talks about how great this country is and how beautiful this country is. But we're not there. We're far from there because we've got a whole population of people that's been forgotten. And until we get to that place where we all have a true, fair and equal just society, we're doing injustice to each other. This is why this is an important conversation. This is why all people, especially in the helping field, need to understand what this country did to an entire race of people. Because you cannot deny the data. No, you can't. Right? So, let's fix it. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you for opening my eyes and opening up the students' eyes with regards to the roots of the problem. And hopefully this will strike a nerve that will have more you know, caregivers and providers to help uproot the problem and um, start being a part of the solution. Awesome, my pleasure. It's been a pleasure, thank you so much. Hey!